Okay, good morning everyone um, and welcome to our OPEX webinar for this month. And uh, today we're gonna, we've got a really uh, kind of a cool um, and a little bit of a different, cool format and a different format for us. We've got a, um, a whole group of people from, um, from Toshiba who are our guests today. So you're gonna hear from a bunch of different people today, four or five people. Um, and they're gonna be talking about some work they've done with operational excellence over the last few years um, and, and how they've improved the customer experience and the employee experience as well. So hopefully, hopefully this is, you know, highly relevant to everyone because it sounds like a pretty good thing to do for most businesses. Um, I am Tim Healy, uh, and it's nice to meet you all via our webinar again. Um, I do these webinars sort of regularly, so a lot of you guys have come across in the real world at conferences or whatnot, or some people we get on here a lot. So. Welcome everyone and thanks for coming along today. Um, a few notes at the beginning just before we get going um, with the guys from Toshiba. Um, if you need to contact us for any reason, uh, which could be you're interested in coming on our webinar or um, you had a question for a guest that you didn't get to ask or that didn't get asked, if you've got comments, ideas, um, or you want to talk to us about anything else, uh, feel free to contact us through our webinar email, which is down the bottom of the slide there, webinars at instituteopex.org. And we're always very happy to hear from you guys with any ideas um, you might have for things we should do with our webinar or otherwise. So, um, and we'll, just before we get going, we always like to have a quick look at what we're doing next time as well. So next month, we've got Gina Melendez from Angelica on, um, and she's going to be talking um, a lot about culture and how to interact with your employees, how to get the change going when you're going through an OPEX transformation. Because um, that all builds, you know, it's really important to that autonomous value stream flow that we talk about. So Gina's, you know, she'll be great. She's been doing this stuff a long time. I've known her several years and she's very active in the, you know, in the manufacturing community, she's part of many um, sort of groups and nonprofits and things as well, I think. So she'll be a really cool guest too. I um, want to mention quickly our live events that we have coming up. We've got uh, in the end of April, we've got Atlanta, and then we move to London, Portland, and Chicago, and then on to Austin throughout the year. Um, we also have a new event that we're running, which is implementing operational excellence. It's a shorter event. We've got one planned for Hartford. Uh, in August and then uh, one in Chicago in October. It's a two-day event and it, this is all about implementation. So the others, we are teaching you how to do this stuff, how to design a value stream, getting into all the technical number crunching. Our two-day session, our new uh, um, live event, that is focused on all the problems and stuff you encounter when you're trying to do it for real in your operation. And uh, Kevin Dugan will be at that one and some of our other guys as well. So if anyone's interested in that, if you've taken our other live events, we would love to have you at those. So um, upcoming webinars, we've got uh, some uh, shared resources webinars, high mix webinars. These are all educational ones. And again, there'll be recordings available to those uh, if you can't make it for the whole thing. And those dates and everything are always available on our website. And getting into today's uh, show, into what we're going to be talking about today, which is why you're all here. Um, today we've got, we've actually got a whole, I mean, it, it says Alexis there. Um, we've got a whole team from Toshiba today because these guys are all part of this implementation. They're all part of running this transformation. So they, they all want to talk to you, which is awesome. Uh, we have Alexis, um, who's an application engineer from Toshiba. And we also have Laura, Chris, and Glenn on the line as well. Um, I think Robin, Robin Stratton's name is on there, but I don't think Robin could make it today. But we do have the rest of the team um, here. And they're gonna talk about how they've applied this material in a, a you know, in a customer service kind of environment at a, you know, high, an engineered, higher mix kind of business. Um, now, just before, I'm gonna get these guys to introduce themselves in a second. Before I do that, I want to remind you all and ask you to interact with us through this webinar. The more questions you ask, the more conversational this becomes, and I think the more interesting it becomes. So if you have questions about anything the team did or any of the results they had or 
um, any of their opinions on, on anything really. I mean, I guess try and keep it focused on operational excellence. But hey, anything you want to ask, feel free to type it into the questions window, um, which is a part of your go to webinar pop up box that you should have there. You can type those questions in. I will ask them of the guys periodically as we go through this. Um, and then we'll also, you know, we might take some questions at the end as well. We generally try and wrap it up in the hour we have planned, but sometimes we do we do take more questions and keep going. Um, so the more the merrier on that front, please. Um, and I should say, uh, Alexis did ask me to mention this, and it's a lot of our guests um, ask this of us. They're going to share what they've done at Toshiba, and you know it's very generous of them to provide this information to us and to you guys. There is a limit to what they can provide, obviously. Um, anything that is related to any customer information or anything that they see as being you know, sensitive information as far as their own competitors go, they're not going to be able to talk about. You know, they, they can't, uh, there are certain things they won't be able to touch on. So I would still encourage you to ask whatever you want, but you know, if, if these guys ha or, or I have to say, look, sorry, we can't, we can't really get into that, because it's too sensitive. Um, please be understanding of that. It's you know that's that's the world we live in, and it's it's totally cool. So just be aware that that could be a thing. All right. So I'm going to have each of these guys introduce themselves, and then we're going to get into their presentation and get this thing rolling. So we'll start with you, Alexis. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and pass it around the team, and then we can uh, we can kick it off. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Alexis Sammons and I'm an applications engineer for our Motors Group at Toshiba. Um, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Laura. Um, I also am an applications engineer in the Low Voltage Motors Group at Toshiba. Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Glenn. I am also a Low Voltage Motor Application Engineer with Toshiba. Good morning, everyone. This is Chris. I am an application specialist with Toshiba in the motor department. Okay, cool. Thank you, everyone. And hey, just before uh, this, this might be in your first slide, Alexis, but or whoever's going to kick it off. So I, I uh, visited Toshiba. Um, I think I met you guys four or five years ago. But make sure you tell us exactly what you guys make too, um, because Toshiba, big corporation, big big conglomerate that makes a lot of different things. So make sure you let everyone know, if you can obviously, what it is you guys do there. But all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna flip forward here and um, we are going to hand it over, which means I have to hand the um, screen sharing over to Alexis or whoever, I think it's, uh, is it Chris, are you starting today? No, it's actually Laura. Oh, it's Laura starting, sorry. Okay, so I am going to hand the control over to you guys. And you are now the presenter, so you guys can show us your presentation. And let me know. There we go. Excellent. All right, take it away, guys. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, just a quick overview of Toshiba, I guess. Um, we are the industrial division here. Uh, we manufacture um, industrial motors, controls, uh, switch gear, and um, adjustable speed drives. Um, we have four manufacturing plants at this facility. So, uh, with that, um, I'll go. I'll jump into our our presentation here, um, and I'm going to talk about our rabbit hole. Um, and basically, uh, sometimes when viewing our workloads, it felt as if we were going down a rabbit hole, meaning there was no end in sight. As a team, we had to evaluate what our challenges were. One of our main challenges was limited visibility among team members. Limited visibility created duplicate work. Response time varied by team member and type of request and variation of complexity of that request. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Alexis and she's gonna run us through our expectations. Thank you. Okay, so one of the first tasks we worked on was to set our expectations and business objectives. So Eric, our guide, um, he stressed that it didn't matter how attainable they may have sounded to us, uh, that we would worry about that later. 
So as you can see from our slides, now this is one of several slides that we ended up having as a group. Um, our expectations included tools and improvement and quote process, create uh, processes with visibility, improve efficiency, and create other tools to help us um, see our workload. So um, along with other slides that included um, increase in customer satisfaction and response time and other business objectives, um, which in turn would positively affect our growth as a company. So, so basically, Alexis, yes. If you, if, if you don't mind, um, so can you tell me, you guys, so you, the value streams you're talking about here, you're, you're delivering, you're answering quote requests and deliver, delivering quotes to the customer. Um, would you be able to tell us a little bit about, um, you know, were you having, were you having problems there? Were you, did you guys feel like you were losing, losing work because you weren't quick enough or, um, you know, what was going on there in the current state? Well, as an applications team, um, we do, um, have to meet a demand from customers, but we also have to meet a demand from within our organization as well. So it wasn't okay. just necessarily uh, customers, but our customers within the organization as well. Quests for that we like engineering sure, changes? Yeah we, or... to, yeah, we had to make sure that we were able to respond. Okay. All right, mm -hmm. great, keep going. So, I'll, I'll so stop in interrupting for, for sorry, now. So in formulating the expectations, we kind of asked ourselves, why we weren't achieving all the goals we had set out for ourselves as a group. So we were achieving some goals, but not all the goals set out for ourselves. Um, and just kind of asked ourselves what obstacles were keeping us from our goals. So it was based on these expectations that we began choosing our value streams. So it sounds like a simple and perhaps basic approach to business, um, but what it did was to create a common vision among the entire team. So what we found um, after listing the expectations was that most of our expectations fit into four main categories. So um, as you see here, our categories or our understood expectations were customers, sales teams, the manufacturing plant, and management. And once we established and defined our expectations, it was time to get to work. Our leap into lean guidelines. So as a group, we understood that um, it was necessary for us to become more efficient in order for us to keep up with the demand. Um, and again, the demand came from different sources, right? So our workload needed to be evaluated and it needed to be broken down and calculated as a team, not, uh, not individually. So the break from the thought of my day to what is the group workload was a change of focus and understanding for us. So then we were um, introduced to the nine lead guidelines. So as you can see here, the slide shown, that's our original, um, worksheet for our nine lead lean guidelines. So we started off with um, tack time. What is our tack time? So tack time is the customer demand rate. So and it's it's, a, it's, a, and it's an equation that was given to us, effective working time per time period divided by the customer request per time period. So we were able to calculate that. Um, and then we looked for places where we could create a uh, continuous flow. Um, after we did that, we looked for places where FIFOs could be created. Um, in our case, we had several FIFOs um, that could be created uh, for our workload. So, and number four, we looked for places where we could establish workflow cycles. Um, so one of those was in process one for us. Um, so number five was um, integration of events. 
So integration of events is where you have multiple inputs to match the outputs. And in our case, we didn't have any places where we could create integration of events. Um, all our outputs were, um, were customized, right, to the demands. So, and number six, we asked ourselves, where could we standardize work? And in our case, many different places. Most places we could standardize work. So, so numbers one through six kind of outlined the design of the future state, just kind of gave us a guide, right? The guideline to design the future state. And starting with number seven, that's where you start implementing the future state. So in number seven, we asked ourselves, could we define a single point of initialization? Um, so in our case, it included the, you see our notes, the RCPD, so that included the review, confirm, prioritize, and distribute. Could we do that with our workload? So number eight was our pitch. Um, could we create a visual pitch? So the, the pitch is just a visual time frame management. Um, it basically just lets you know if you're on time or not. And it's a visual, so we were able to do that. And finally, changes in demand. So we asked ourselves, how will we respond to changes in demand after creating or designing our future state? So this is where we created and formulated backup plans. So the questions that we were asked, um, we used them as a guideline to understanding the entire process and how people were involved and fit in. Um, established workflows um, that worked our way through the nine lead gui lean guidelines. Sorry, I keep saying lead. Um, also as important going through this process uh, that we realized was the establishment of the FIFO lanes. That was really crucial to our design. Um, and um, a simple and effective approach was to establish the need to establish schedules. So for example, one of our um, effective um, schedules is our phone time. So we are all um, tech, tech engineers as well. So we have to provide tech support to everyone, uh, customers and in, internally as well. And so we found that scheduling phone times for us was a more efficient way to approach it. So after we evaluated and um, after we understood that we needed to create the design, um, it was time for change. I'm going to hand it over to Chris, and he's going to tell you about our change. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, one of the first steps towards change was to outline our current sequence of work, uh, basically setting up a groundwork or a framework for uh, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, one of the biggest delays we discovered was the constant interruptions, whether they be legitimate, valuable, work-related, uh, they still interrupted the flow of our day-to-day -day work, as I'm sure most people have at uh, their own positions as well. Um, our solution was to implement a rotational time that uh, we simply called quiet time. And uh, I just want to make sure, can everyone still see the presentation? Are we still okay? Uh, yep, yep, I think we're good. Okay. We're having a little bug here. I can certainly see it. Okay. Oh, now we can see uh, your chat window. Gotcha. Um, so uh, that quiet time, just to kind of expand on that a little bit, um, basically from hang on, our- hang on a second, Chris. Sorry, um, I think we can, I think you need to pop your chat window back down and your questions window, because I can see both of those. Okay. There we go, that's good. And don't right. feel bad, this, this uh, webinar software is, it always seems more complex than it needs to be. <laughs> so, okay, we're good now. Totally cool. Yep, you're good now, keep going. Oh, gotcha, apologize there. Um, so for the quiet time, uh, what we ended up doing was having our time split up on a day-to-day -day basis where some of the application engineers would 
have time to be on the phones and help out with other tasks. And the other portion of the day, um, these app engineers, um, we would actually be focused in solely on getting our quotes done. Um, we were not to be bothered by any uh, incoming sources, uh, you know, uh, phone calls, uh, anyone stopping by our desks. Um, and that was basically what we focused in on its quiet time. Uh, when we did enforce these quiet times, there was a little bit of resistance from other departments who hadn't yet implemented these uh, because they didn't understand the process yet. However, these quiet times were actually very effective and uh, we actually each looked uh, forward to them because it gave us more time to focus in on our tasks without the, uh, these distractions. Uh, after exposing issues with the current state, it was uh, it was almost second nature to try these try to fix these issues on the fly, um, which is not a good idea. So Eric did put a stop to that uh, because it was very important that we had to design a future map. Uh, it was also very important to everyone on the team. They followed the same method for his or her own task to keep everything uniform, and it helped the flow. Um, where value was added, that's where the flow needed to be. The future state had to accommodate for a percentage of work not reflected in the current state. And with Eric's help, we designed a future map that really met our demand. Now, keep in mind that the future map was designed for our day-to-day -day process, which includes a plan A, B, and C, with plan A being our day-to-day -day process where everything's flowing as it normally should be. Plan B would be the backup plan to that where we may need to bring in um, a little bit of assistance to help the flow. And plan C furthering that would be where we would bring in additional help. Um, so we had to keep a close watch on how often we were on plans B and C and uh, they would help determine a redesign of the future map if need be. Because the first few couple of months implementing these, uh, we were in plan B for that period of time. But as we implemented and refined our systems and processes, we were in plan A. So there was never really a need for plan C, which is very good news and everything was flowing as it should have. So uh, now I'm gonna hand it over to Glenn to discuss how a positive frame of mind is key to implementing a successful future state. Yes, good morning, everyone. So yeah, the positive mindset uh, we found keeping a positive mindset was very important to the success of this project. And so we got everybody to buy in on it. Everyone did agree that there was room for improvement and success depended on participation from the entire group. Uh, we found that brainstorming gave everybody a voice in this whole creative process. And we uncovered a lot of uh, inconsistencies, uh, non-productive, uh, you know, processes that we had used and that kind of vetted that out. So that was really important with the brainstorming part of it. Uh, the path forward, an implementation plan was created and this implementation plan outlined our value stream objectives for the different FIPO lanes and each object objective was given an owner and included several team members. Uh, each objective was given a start and a finish date, and we categorized those as being either complete, ongoing, or late. The uh, initial visual tracking system, as you can see here, is some rudimentary um, visuals that we had started with. Uh, we needed something to give us an immediate visual of our current state. It had to be something highly visible so that anyone walking into our department could immediately see if we were on track. Uh, these visual indicators had to meet four criteria or attributes and they, they were visual, they had to be physical, binary, and they had to be easily understood. So we initially chose a simple yet effective way of showing our daily flow and progress. Uh, we originally used uh, colored Lego blocks to visually show our demand, quote processed, technical information request, our pitch, et cetera. As you can see, the thermometer is, um, was a highly visible gauge that showed everyone that was 
walking into our department to see what our progress was. So from that initial rudimentary tracking system, uh, we need something uh, a little bit more uh, to give us some more information. So we continued to evalu evaluate and improve. Uh, we began using a software system that gave us even more visibility. Uh, with the new software system, we were able to run reports and follow trends, giving us greater flexibility to immediately adjust to current state conditions. Uh, so with this new system, all requests come in to a point of initialization that entails an email box. And from there, the department gatekeeper distributes this request to the appropriate IFO lanes. And then from there, the pace setter will assign the task to the individual application engineer. All of this is visible, visible to both the application engineer and the pace, set, pace setter to ensure real-time visibility of continuous flow in the FIFO lanes. So shown here is an example of one of the many reports that we can view in real time. And we can run several different reports that show all various uh, attributes. Uh, yeah, so from here, I'm going to let Laura offer our conclusion. So basically through this whole process, what we learned is to focus and identify on those activities that add value to the organization and not waste time on non-value added tasks. As a team, we must be willing to change and evolve. We understand that improvement is a continuous process and we cannot become stagnant. Visibility of the entire workload is essential to success. Cool, now is that, is that your last slide, Guy? Yes, that is our last slide. Awesome, all right, well thank you very much for that. Now, obviously I've got a ton of questions for you, so this is the fun bit. <laughs> Um, and, you know, any one of you guys is welcome to answer these or you can all jump in, um, whatever you like. Um, we'll, we've got some good questions here. So, firstly, um, back towards, and it, if you want, if you guys want to, you can flick back to, if there's a relevant slide, by all means, flick back and forth. Um, so, at the beginning, you talked about shifting from an in, a focus on individual workload to a focus on team workload. Now, and I think you described that as you started looking at the overall demand in terms of what was the demand on the team rather than what was the demand on each individual. What what were the, I gather you got, you, did you get any pushback on that shift from individual to team? And if so, what was the concern around that? Just because I, this is something I try and, you know, I'm always trying to teach and sometimes it scares people a little bit because, uh, you know, it, it, it takes away from that ownership, not ownership as in, in a good way, but it, it removes the silos and it, it means you don't have your own little kingdom that no one else knows about. Um, it's not a mystery anymore. So how, how was the response when you shifted to looking at individual workload versus team workload? So because we are um, evaluated as a team in general, um, we have several teams here at Toshiba, and we each of us understood that it was necessary for the entire team to be successful because if one person on the team is not successful, then that does not make the team successful. So uh, honestly, our team, um, our entire team was on board. Um, so we didn't really get that pushback from our team members. Um, and like I said, because individually, um, we knew that we had to come together as a team and move forward. So so we did, so <clears throat> as far as pushback externally from, from um, the individuals that were sending requests into our group, um, we did have some resistance there because people were used to dealing with, you know, who they were used to dealing with. Um, so we just had to keep reinforcing um, to use the uh, main box. Um, if, 
that wasn't happening, then we ourselves put it into the main box so that the answer was not necessarily coming from the person that they were used to dealing with. And so that helped um, with a comfort level, you know, especially as, a, as an organization, you have new people come in. Um, and so it just kind of uh, created a comfort level to um, our external and internal customers to deal with somebody different. And now, you know, there's no, and there's no hard results in this presentation, which I am going to assume is because you can't, you don't want to share specific quote times or customer response times, which is totally fine, obviously. But would it be safe to say that with, with those people that were initially concerned, I'm, I'm going to, I, I, I mean, I know that you guys got good results. So did people just relax more because hey, if I trust the team to get the information back to me quickly, I don't really care that much who gives it to me. I just want my information in a timely fashion. Was that evident? Um, not immediately, no. <laughs> okay. um, as you know, change is, um, change is kind of difficult sometimes, right? Um, yeah. So the people who were used to going to certain individuals um, still went to those individuals. Now, what we had to do as a team, um, if you remember me mentioning that point of initialization, so the requests that came in through a variety of sources, whether it's it was in person or on the phone or through email, um, it all had to enter that point of initialization. So as a team, um, we were on board. Because we were on board, we were able to do that. Um, now, the responses, uh, the feedback that we, um, in response to the requests, came from a variety of, of people uh, from our department. So then the people who were used to going to individual persons within our group started getting used to seeing responses from other team members. So okay. it wasn't immediate, but I think yeah. uh, we've gained that trust, I think. Yeah, this, and it does again. I'm sorry. No, keep going, you're good. Yes. Yeah, so this is Glenn, and, and one, of the, uh, one of the big benefits that I found with this was that uh, it was almost impossible to maintain a FIFO with the system that we had before. Because you would constantly get interrupted with the squeaky wheel, you know, this is important, do this one first. Uh, with the system we implemented, we were able to keep on track with the first in, first out, and handle the requests. Uh, the other issue that was a problem, a little bit of a problem that this helped with, was uh, overloading. We would have certain individuals in the department, one day might be overloaded versus a, another person was uh, lightly loaded. So it balanced the workload amongst us. And then finally, you know, if an individual was out of the office on a, a business trip or took a PTO day, uh, basically that would just sit in that person's inbox because the individual is used to working with that person. Now they're out of the office that day and their request doesn't get taken care of. Yeah, that's a, an old classic, that one. <laughs> it's amazing, that stuff. And, you know, I think that the more successful you are and the more, more consistently you, you produce what, you, what you've said you will produce, the more customers and other departments having you and the easier it is for them to relax and not go to that favourite person that they normally go to. And, and that in turn helps with the work balancing because what I normally find is you know, in a team, there'll be someone that's been there longer or who knows everyone, um, and that's the person that gets the most interruptions. That's the one everyone wants to go to because it's, it's easier to take it to him or her than it is to sort of meet the new person and and you're not sure about their response time. So it's, it's funny how that works. So the, the balancing of work is a, probably a, a hugely beneficial knock-on. Um, yeah, correct. and. To add on to that, I, I, you're right about that. Um, there, collectively, I think as a team, um, we have over a hundred years experience. 
So, <laughs> so yes, there are, um, you know, those members who have um, more experience than others, and those were the ones. You're right; those are the ones that were continuously um, sought, right, for information. Yeah, yeah, um, and it, it, yeah, it, it, it's very common in a lot of offices. That is something you see all the time. So. Moving along then, you, you talked about, you talked through all of the tools, which was great, the, the known lean guidelines. Um, just quickly, did you guys create any continuous flow or any part-time continuous flow cells or did that not happen for you guys? Um, we did, we did create continuous flow cells. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, now I probably can't ask you exactly what you were continuously flowing because that would be a bit of a, that might be sensitive, but, um, was that a hard thing to implement? Did it take a bit of education or did people pick it up pretty quickly and were okay with it? Well, I'll say even setting up the continuous flow cells was a continuous process from the very beginning because when we first went through the process, we were, we were concentrating on just one flow, um, which covered, you know, maybe 60% of what we did every day, right? So we very quickly had to add different flows depend, you know, um, that we broke down what type of request we get. They, it was broken down um, in that in categories of what type of requests that we get. Um, mm. And then, um, and by, by the complexity of that request. So um, that's kind of how we set up our workflow. Good. So we, we actually ended up with, uh, I think it was eight total continuous flows. Okay, and now that, you know, to the to my ear, that sounds like, whether you guys called it that, it sounds like you've defined your service family, and that's um, it's really important because you won't, you know, as these guys have obviously figured out, um, you won't really get good continuous flow without grouping work, grouping similar work, because you don't want two entirely different things following each other through a continuous flow cell, uh, cell necessarily. Um, but that's good. That's cool that you guys got that done because that is one of the harder ones to do. Um, and now, this is another one. Now, if you guys can't answer this, this is totally cool. You mentioned standard work as well, and now you also told us that you guys do a lot of a lot of your work is there's going to be variation in it because you're doing applications engineering, be it to a customer or you, maybe an engineering change internally or something like that. But how did you go about? applying standard work in an environment that was quite or is quite variable. Do you, are you able to give some examples of that? Um, and if, if not, no problem. Um, well, one of the um, one of the things that we focused on um, as far as the standardization was um, the information provided to us, okay? So in order for us to, let's say, uh, provide a quote to customers, um, we had to make sure that that information was complete. So in our point of initialization, that was one of the things that we focused on um, before the request entered into our continuous flow, we had to make sure that all that information required was complete. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a, a good one. And that, that stuff makes such a big difference. I was at a, um, a company recently and they make, these guys make um, machines that you use in your factory, like grinders or CNC machines and stuff. So they make the machine. And, these machines are hugely expensive and hugely complex and their sales team would send, the, the sales team would visit, and this isn't even the customer, this is the sales team, the sales team would visit a new customer or an existing customer and send the inside sales team, like, or you know, the, the you guys equivalent, they'd send them an email saying, they need a quote on a six spindle machine and that would be it. And <laughs> And you know, you're talking about a multi-million dollar machine that can be configured in a million different ways, and right, and it would just lead to this massive back and forth, which took right. days to figure out what they wanted. And 
Now, they couldn't, they had a, a sheet, a standard worksheet they wanted their team to fill in, and they couldn't get them to do it. How did you guys go at getting that standard work filled in? Was it easy or was it hard to get it adopted or? So I'm not, so I'm not sure if I'm real clear on the question, but um, basically what has worked for us is that we have everything that comes into this central location. Um, and that, and from there, we actually have somebody that goes in and distributes it into the different flows. And they'll all, and at that stage, they'll also pull out anything that doesn't belong in our group because we get a lot of requests that maybe belong to a different group in the company and, um, or uh, they can tell right away that there's going to be a question on it and they'll kick it back to whoever sent it to get that answer before it gets down to an app engineer. Once it goes into the flows, then we actually have a pace setter. So that pace setter is a little bit more knowledgeable than the, the initial gatekeeper. So the pace setter will take just a quick look at the request, not read through the whole thing, but, but a quick look um, to see if there's anything very obvious that hasn't been included. Um, and so then it can be sent back to whoever sent the request to ask for clarifications before it actually gets sent to the app engineer uh, to try to get an answer quicker and before it goes to an app engineer that spends a lot of time on it to realize that they can't do anything with it. So we have a couple of places where we actually triage the request a little bit before they actually get to the app engineers um, so that by the time they get it, they should hopefully be able to, to complete the request. So that's actually, that's pretty cool because that's another point of resistance often. And those points of triage you talk about, often a good idea and something that I often suggest and try and implement with, with companies. And it, it can be a hard thing to do though, because often you get pushback with people saying, no, 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 you don't understand. Our stuff is so complex that you can't even triage it. And personally, as you guys are sort of showing, um, you, there are always indicators of which path it should go down. And, you know, you may not get it right every time. And, and that doesn't necessarily even matter hugely. You just switch it over. But it, it's huge. Being able to clean it up before you enter it into the value stream so, saves you so much back and forth later on. And it's also worth acknowledging, though, um, the, the, the ultimate result there is to not need the triage, is to push that standard work to the point where it can just flow straight in. Now, that may not be possible because you do have a massive mix, but always working towards that is a good thing. But that, that's pretty cool that you guys had not one, but two points of triage in there to get it. Because it sort of shows that you understood the value of getting information clean and, and ready to go before working on it, um, which is huge. So that that's really good. Um, now, moving along, um, I want to talk about, you, you talked about your quiet time, um, which uh, sounds a lot like a workflow cycle and that, you know, did you see, did you notice productivity gains when people are, were on their, their quiet time? Um, would, did you get a, a bump from that, a productivity bump? Definitely. Yes, absolutely. It was an immediate bump. <laughs> yeah, okay. I bet you got a happiness bump too because lo and behold, people don't actually love going to status meetings all day, every day, their whole life. Um, <laughs> sometimes they want to do the work that they're employed to do. So that's cool. Um, yeah, and, and, and it was scheduled throughout our day, right? So it wasn't yeah. that we were always on quiet time. Um, because it's nearly impossible to work that way. Um, yeah. But it did give us that time frame where we could address um, what we needed to address immediately without any interruptions. Yeah. I mean, it, it does. Having those, those designated quiet times, as you call them, is, is great for productivity and getting work done. And it you know, a lot of the time people people have questions for you that they think are urgent but really aren't and it sort of gives you a way of dampening all that out. Um, you also talked about your visuals, um, which I found interesting. So, and I remember seeing some pictures of this at the time. I remember seeing pictures of the little Lego figures marching down the um, board. 
I think it might have been a Star Wars theme or something. But um, would you guys, you know, you obviously came up with some quick and dirty visuals quickly so you could get that visual management going. Would you advise that to other people? Like, were you happy with your quick, cheap, hey, let's just get it visual approach? Or would you say, no, you should stop and come up with the software before you do anything? Um, well, one thing that was stressed to us was that we needed to get an immediate visual. Um, and so we decided to do a fun thing with the Legos. Um, and we, we have a, a lot of different characters in our group. Um, so we, we, it was fun picking avatars for ourselves. Um, so we had fun with that. So I, I, even though, you know, we still were able to follow the processes and, and, um, and see immediately what, what um, our, our work entailed, uh, we still had fun with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember Eric sending pictures of this pitch thing through and they were Lego characters. But that's, I remember one of them was a Star Wars one and everyone had a character. Um, <laughs> at the time, I was thinking, what, what is that? But, <laughs> I mean, it worked. So that's cool. I mean, so you found a way to make it even a little bit fun. Um, yes, yes. Help people adopt it. Yeah, and the immediate, the immediate visibility was really important because it showed us that we had a pretty uh, significant improvement um, immediately. Um, yeah. It was pretty amazing how, how quickly we saw that, that we had, um, had improved um, and that it was an easy transition from, uh, you know, that to turn it into a software program. Um, you know, and yeah. I'm going to ask you about the software in a second, but another cool thing about your visual particularly, you know, particularly the, the really crazy stuff like the, the Lego characters. Um, now, for everyone listening, I, I don't, I, I did not work with these guys on this, but the Lego characters were basically, I think, showing pitch. So they were marching down, a, down the wall and, you know, you could see where each one was versus where it should be. So now the thing about things like that is though, that was pretty simple, pretty easy, you know, a cheap thing to implement wasn't totally crazy, didn't, didn't have to make the whole office into something ridiculous, but something fun like that, the other benefit is that it, it engages other people because people walk past it and say, what is that? And now you've got their attention and you have the opportunity to explain to them what your team is doing, um, which is, is an opportunity for you guys that are doing the project to broaden the education, spread the word a little bit, maybe even tell them how they can participate in it or how they should participate in it. So did you guys find that? Did it, did it capture the attention of other people in the business as well? Yes, we did. <laughs> we did find that it did catch the attention of others. They would come in and question what, you know, what is this for <laughs> and question the different characters. <laughs> and, um, so yes, it, it did catch the interest of others in the company. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I mean, and it's, you know, it's a good thing to think about something like that because it's a little bit of marketing for your, your own effort there. Um, and with all of these value stream transformations, you, you almost inevitably need the cooperation of other people in other departments. So it, it's a good way to build it. Now, um, I said I'd ask you about the software. Um, I want to point out that the way these guys have described this, They've designed their value stream using the, line, the nine lane guidelines. They've implemented it. They've made it visual with some, some cheap, quick visuals that are, hey, they may not be the fanciest thing in the world, but they're showing the results and they are showing whether the flow is normal or abnormal. So they're doing the job that we need done. And then they've gone and designed or adapted some software to suit the exact needs of their value stream. So I really want to point out, software is great and fine, but it's, it seems so much more efficient to get the thing working how you want it to work, and now go and get the software program that supports that, rather than having to buy, buy in software, and now, you know what, we've got to compromise our value stream design, or we've got to design a value stream around the software program. So. I just wanted to point that out to everyone. And then, you know, what you guys, we don't, I'm not really into the software side of it. I don't have a stake in that game. What did you use? Like, what is it? 
Uh, if so, you want to tell us, you may not be able to tell us that, and that's fine. Well, there are several. <laughs> okay. Depending on um, depending on on the on the value strings. Okay. And you know what? You know, it sounds like maybe that's something that's private. So, um, you know, if these guys want, they can email us questions about it, and um, we can certainly answer those by email or not, maybe. Um, but that's an easy way to do that. So. I have a question, just another question which has been sitting in the question box for a little while, but it seemed like a good one to ask towards the end of the presentation. So, um, you know, you guys created a lot of change, you got some good results, and I know you started on this several years ago and you're still talking about it, so I'm hoping there's been some good sustainment. But the question is, what, what tools are you guys using to ensure the process you've implemented remains as efficient as possible? Well, one of the tools is the software that, okay. that we use. Um, so I have to point out that creating this design for our team um, has facilitated uh, the training of new members coming into our team um, and introducing the, the, the workflow cycles to them has made things easier and quicker for them to adapt to our team. Um, okay. So a lot of what we use now to answer your question is the software. Okay. We and constantly, is, yeah, so we constantly review like the incoming demand <clears throat> and where we are with our, our pitch. So our pitch may change, um, you know, the tag time may change. So things change, uh, we have to keep adjusting. Um, you know, we may find something new might pop up that we need to start tracking um, so so it's constantly changing and evolving so we've never uh, you know we didn't just settle on something and say this is what we're going to do we've, we've just consistently um, continued to change and evolve to try to make it fit what we do um, as things change in our group um, so we do kind of reevaluate we sit down every so often with the group that went through the program and kind of reevaluate where we are and, and what changes we need to make. That's cool. And um, the, the, the software, whatever it is, it obviously makes things visual for you and getting good visual management in place is really important to your sustainment because if you make the, the, I don't know, the result visual, it, when, it, when the, the visuals go red, you, it kind of means you need to respond or you're going to get questions because that condition is visible. So that's another important thing there. Um, and I, you know, I also know Toshiba's pretty good with their ongoing education. Um, I know that I think occasionally you guys run another class or you send people to training events. So um, and it sounds like you do a good job of bringing new people in, teaching them the system um, and keeping it going. Which is good because the sustainment is. I mean, you got how? When did you start this? It was years ago, right? Two thousand fourteen. Yeah, I mean, that's what two thousand eighteen now. You know, <laughs> that's some good sustainment, um, and and probably better than most companies do, frankly. So that's really cool. You should be very proud of that. Um, so, I think that's the end of the questions I've got. Um, is there any in? Is there anything else you guys wanted to add before we before we sign off? Um, yeah, we just wanted a, a moment to thank you and and the Dugan team and especially Eric for helping us through the process. And we also wanted to uh, thank management team at Toshiba for allowing us to participate in this. Yeah, and I would like to thank them for that too because it's great having you guys on. You did a really good job, and you know I thank you, and I'm sure everyone that was listening and who will listen to this, thanks you guys. Um, because, you know, sharing, sharing the real world side of this is, you know, so important because anyone can read a book or go to a class and learn the technical side of it. Um, but it's, it's making it actually happen that's actually the hard bit. And, you know, four years of this, still going strong, still, and I, I know you guys got really good results. Um, it's, it's really awesome. So thank you for coming on and sharing it. Um, thank you very much for having me.
and I'll, I'll make sure Eric hears about that. Um, <laughs> and uh, so that, you know, thank you to Shiba team. And that's it for today, everyone. I think we're just about coming up on our hour. We're four minutes short of that, which is great. Um, again, we've got that other webinar coming up next month um, with Gina Melendez. And um, so please feel free to join in on that one as well. And if you have any questions, um, for the Toshiba guys or for myself or anyone else at the Institute for OPEX, um, just feel free to send us an email to that webinars at instituteopex.org email address. Find us on LinkedIn. Um, always happy to chat. Give us a call. So thank you everyone for tuning in and we will chat to you for the OPEX webinar again next month.